Hi. When Steve asked me last Friday to present tonight uh, at Laser, the first thing I, I did was clean my desk. Uh, birthday cards, property taxes, that time of year. And I found an article that I had been keeping from the LA Times in the California section. The date was November 14th, 2017. The story was about the Cassini Project. <laughs> and members at JPL mourning the death of a dear and longtime friend, which was the casino. Their emotions, oh God. in the article, in this article there, was, there were multiple pictures the emotions in his photos, you know, overflowed their faces. And the, the team members were finally separated from their mission. And a period of mourning was upon them. Some had been with the project for 20 years. Can you imagine the intense preparation? The endless years of collaboration between them. The ritual of observation. As one of my JPL friends said, you try to figure out everything that can go wrong so you can figure out what to do right. The human story of this shows us the magnificence of this project, the memory and the emotion of their relationship and their mourning will carry them decades into the future. As I was looking among some of these photos in the article, I recognized several of the Cassini project members. They participated in Caltech theater. And I didn't know that, I was looking at it, like, I recognize some of these people. They had participated in Caltech theater. I serve as the head of Caltech theater. I train engineers and scientists and researchers in creative endeavors and critical thinking. We put on classical, modernist, postmodernist, post-millennial plays, musicals, storytelling, improvisation. And I dedicate myself to create work at the intersection of science and art, forging the relevance of the arts in relation to our understanding of science. When I uh, planned out the Stephen Sondheim musical, company last year. This is not it. When I, when I uh, started to put together company last year, one of the actors told me, this musical is like climbing Mount Everest and you don't even have a map yet. <laughs> Nowhere near the scale of the Cassini project, obviously, but the collaboration, the intense group effort with a dozen musicians and dance numbers and costumes and props and scenes and lights and sound and dialogue and with upwards of 50 people involved towards nearly a nearly uh, insurmountable task of Sondheim Musical. We created this amazing space together with scientists. Some of these pictures are from a play we did called Rossum's Universal Robots. It was a play uh, written by Carol Chapek in the 1924, and we did it on the Caltech campus. Uh, the play inspired many writers, including Philip K. Dick and Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, if you've seen that. It was a cautionary tale that introduced the road, a word a robota, a slave into common parlance. The robots were made by humans, but one of the professors, Dr. Gall, you know, the Gall, to give one robot an extra ounce of some organic mass and vital substance that suddenly flipped the switch and all the robots turned deadly and they attacked their human, their human makers. The power of science to create life. And for all of these 
grad students and undergrads and JPLers that are, that are in this photo, they begin to work outside of the lab where we can create a <laughs> church time? <laughs> <laughs> um, so this idea of taking people outside of the laboratory, outside of mission control in a sense, and creating this space for dialogue and the ethical issues, in this case, around the rise of robots. And you see what's, what's just happened is all the robots have ro rose up and have killed all of their, their masters, their, their makers. And here's just some pictures of, of the emotion that goes into when you realize the robots that you've created are about to destroy you. <laughs> so, as we make these plays, uh, theater provides a space for translation. They're transferable skills. We are, we are not alone. The, the closeness of these project members up at JPL and down at Caltech with each other, share these stories of science, they, they connect us through times. And in the selection of these science-driven plays, I attempt to situate the plays in a historical context and a perspective, to shine a light upon complex issues, to examine the ethical nature of science through theater. <laughs> in this case, you know, the rise of robots and robot intelligence and all that brings up. In Bertolt Brecht's Galileo, we presented the struggle of scientific knowledge against totalitarian censorship. As the Pope forces Galileo to recant his observations, that the Earth was not the center of the universe and that it was only a planet rotating around the sun, Brecht draws parallels, not just to the science, but to Pope Urban VIII and the Italian merchants and the industrialists of Nazi Germany and Hitler's war machine. Science and faith. Even more so, Brecht, through the mouthpiece of Galileo, is haunted by science in the hands of totalitarian leaders. The relevance of Brecht's work still remains powerful and the dialogue alive in our scientists. Uh, the memorandum, Vaclav Havel, he was the president of um, the Czech Republic, too, but he was also a playwright, and he understood the first hand, the paranoia stoked by Eastern bureaucrats who will implement orders and you're supposed to follow them no matter how ridiculous they are, you must follow those orders for the government. In the play, they even create a language called patidipi that everybody pretends to know and understand, but it's all official gibberish. And it causes fear amongst all of them and a certain kind of self-censorship among the workers themselves. You know, how do you translate bureaucracy in a laboratory? We have these conversations. This is, this is not unique to uh, how we run and the, the interaction be between scientists and the language that we use to not only tell our truth back to those in power, but also to challenge those in power. Uh, with Mate, we explored the mathematical genius of Bobby Fischer, the great chess champion, who you may know, uh, we traced his journey here to Pasadena, that people knew that. We traced his uh, journey to Pasadena where he was picked up for vagrancy with a blender and an anti-Semitic track from the elders of Zion underneath the... Uh, Hill Street, uh, it's a Lake Street, Lake under the underpass, the overpass, the underpass, the underpass, the overpass. <laughs> on Lake Street, that's where they found Bobby Fisher. They picked him up, they threw him in jail here in, in Pasadena. <laughs> How does one travel that path from such brilliance to such crippling, ferocious, anti Semitic anger? We discuss these issues of madness and genius. Hey, right? bring up huge issues. And this is, what we, this is where we are. In Playwright Mark Eckhart's Vavilov's Garden, we examine the relation between power and science in a time of alternative facts. The play resonates so clearly with our present day politics of confirmation bias and, and tribal politics that scientists negotiate daily. 
<laughs> Yosef Stalin put scientists under siege. And if they ran up against the findings of Soviet botanist Tsurfim Lysenko, they often disappeared. They still disappear, even now. For those of you who don't know, the great Soviet biologist Nikolai Vavilov, he collected genetic material of crop specimens from around the world to make existing plants hardier in the harsh Russian climate. His efforts did not align with the party line, and Stalin destroyed him in 1942. Lysenkoism came to be known as bad science by the survivors. Mark Eckhart, who, playwright who passed away quite suddenly last year, writes, quote, we live in a world where facts are irrelevant, and anyone who dares disagrees is labeled an elitist or an enemy of progress. Ideologues persist in their denial in the face of overwhelming evidence, delaying the crucial action needed to prevent catastrophe. In one of our upcoming uh, Mach 33 festival offerings here at the Pasadena Playhouse, it starts uh, April 30th and goes through May 14th, so come on down to the Playhouse. We uh, shows. Uh, I don't want to slide it because it's brand new. It's called Lie After Lie After Lie. <laughs> <laughs> and it follows our hero, Dr. Semmelweis, in 1870s Vienna. Maybe some of you know the story. Who eventually gets forced into an insane asylum as he advocated for the washing of the hands of physicians as they deliver babies. That we said, though, well, if you have any kind of infection on your hands, you may... Uh, induce in the woman um, a, a bacteria that would spread throughout the uterus and rapidly spreading this necrosis of the skin tissue and the fascia and without treatment the, that the fatal bacteria invades and sepsis kills the patient it's called puerperal fever right but it's about men delivering babies and not washing their hands and for years. And some wise is our, our main hero in this play. And it's about lying. It's about the madness of lying. Mm -hmm. And living in a world where there is no solid ground. This is according to the play by Stephen Deeks, Rage Against the Establishment. How could this have happened for so many years? Uh... We did Rashomon a few years ago in the Discounsel Gardens. And Rashomon is a play that takes the truth and looks at it from multiple points of view, right? There's not just one point of view, perspective, that we look at the world through. Theater about science allows us the luxury to contemplate deeply and take action when necessary to combat ignorance. So scientists do. Good scientists, many scientists shout, the science is under siege. We are under siege, many scientists will say, by a political atmosphere of toxic disinformation. But the real problem is that people begin to not care what the truth is anymore. Hence the importance of scientists to help us maneuver and negotiate that truth in an all-encompassing, multi-perspective of Rashomon effect. This is the real problem. People really don't care what the truth is anymore. Vavilov, Vavilov feared that we would lose the biodiversity of species. Some wise, the lives of thousands of women. In an atmosphere of toxic disinformation, we live and end up in a monoculture with cognitive dissonance. Ensnared in the tentacles of Soviet or American propaganda, or censorship, in light of good science, peer reviewed, we must not force the scientists to pledge allegiance to the state of emergency created by false science, the irrevocable, irrevocable nature of life secularism. The role of theater is to keep these issues present contextualize them and to humanize the scientists. We must debunk the debunkers and create community and a passionate search for the truth. Thank you.